usual way, I'm gonna in the usual way, I'm gonna ask you to register your presence. Tammy? Yes. Lee? Yes. Jean? Yes. Sarah? Yes. And Austin is um Austin is here. Uh, I have no changes or additions to the agenda. Uh, next item is the approval of minutes from March 25th. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? I move to approve the minutes. Thank you, Lee. Is there a second? second. That's fabulous. Any additions, corrections to the minutes? Okay, so I'm going to ask you to vote on approving the minutes uh, when I call your name. Tammy? Yes. Far. Oh, yes. Sorry, I did it in a different order. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> Jean? Yes. Lee? Yes. Bob Pam, the question is on voting to approve the minutes of March 25th. Yes. And Austin votes yes. Thank you very much. Uh, public comment. Is there any member of the public who wishes to make a comment? If you would, uh, if you would like to, if you would raise your hand. Okay. Uh, we have five members of the public. Thank you all for coming. Okay, President's report. So uh, we will gather uh, to thank and celebrate our colleague Bob Pam on June 5th at four o'clock in the Goodwin Room. And I urge us all to come wearing our party attire. Uh, and look forward to seeing you all, seeing you all there. Uh, as you know, we are waiting for the bid from the general contractor that is now due on uh, April 26th at two o'clock in the afternoon. We have received bids uh, from subcontractors and the bids that we have so far received are slightly under budget. Uh, some of the some of the items attracted some, you know, two or three subcontractors. Some attracted only one. Uh, so we are we are so to speak waiting for the the bids on the twenty sixth from the general contractor. Uh, and we'll see how they we'll see how they come in. Uh, so I'm. I guess I'm giving you the report from the Jones Library Building Committee. Uh, the Building Committee will, of course, reconvene once the once we have the general contractor bid uh, in hand, and once the general contractor is selected to begin the work with the general contractor uh, that is necessary to uh, begin the construction uh, work. Uh, Sharon, do you want to just uh, talk a little bit about uh, what's happening with our interim location, please? Yeah. Uh, so we were we're really happy to have 101 University Drive as our location, and that that will be our our public facing location. Um, on the first floor is where the children's department will be, um, and on the on the second floor is where all of the other public spaces will be uh, reference and. Um, uh, the adult collections and some computers and uh, ESL special collections. Um, then, uh, because that space, as much as we love 101, uh, it, it's not big enough to hold our entire collection. So, um, so at 65 University Drive, we'll be having uh, our pageable collection. So those will be the collections that patrons can ask for, and, and then librarians will go and get them. Um, and because those two spaces aren't quite enough, there will be a third space that we need for our collection, um, specifically for the adult collection. Uh, and that's about 
about 8,000 items, give or take. And I just got word this morning that Amherst College will be housing those items for free for two years. And this is really, really spectacular. It, it saves us quite a bit of money. Um, and it's just an amazing um, thing for them to do for us. So shout out to Martin Garner, um, the uh, director over at the Frost Library at Amherst College. Um, we've been working hard on finding uh, locations for our fine arts collection. An auctioneer came and 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 took some items like the our, our rugs, and these are all items that are not on our fine arts collection, um, and some smaller some smaller items, a, a, a doll collection. So things that don't have anything to do with, um, they don't they don't fit into our mission, our, our collection development uh, uh, policy. Um, our Grillo uh, mural, which is one piece, one solid piece that has been hanging in the library for 30 years. Um, our curator is working with experts from uh, uh, the Mead Art Museum and, and from the Williamstown um, Clark Art as to how to take it off of the frame and roll it so that we can store it for a couple of years. Um, programming. Uh, we're going to be doing our ESL uh, programs from St. Bridget's, um, not the actual church, but there's a, a separate, I'll call it a, a meeting community house um, that has classrooms. And so we'll be doing conversation circles there, one-on-one -on -one tutoring, as well as our, our senior, uh, senior ESL classes. Um, technology. So technology is going to be a bit complicated. So once we do close uh, it's going to take a couple of weeks at a minimum in order to build out uh, the, the infrastructure at 101. Um, we're going to be reusing uh, most of the equipment that we have at the Jones. So, so it'll be an interesting dance of, of, of shutting down the Jones and then really the library being offline for quite a bit. The, the library meaning the Jones, not the branches. Uh, in order to set up at 101 and then restart at 101. Um, there will be security cameras and the patron counters. Those will all come back into play. And um, and again, so regarding timeline, uh, let me fast forward to the timeline. These are all issues. Uh, nothing is set in stone yet. We won't know until the, the GC bids come back, but we're looking at closing the Jones in May, and that could be early May, it could be the middle of May, it could be the end of May, we're not we're not sure yet. Um, and as far as moving, so once we close the Jones, we're gonna have to um, pack it all up, staff are gonna pack it um, and, and deal with the, all the IT stuff. And, and that's when we will start by increasing the open hours at the two branches. And then in early, June, early, mid, late June, sometime in June. That's when we'll actually move all of the stuff uh, from the Jones over to 101. And again, we will maintain increased open hour schedules at the branches. And then in early July, mid July, we'll reopen at 101. And that's when the hours will go back to normal at the two branches. Um, I think those are those are the highlights. Uh, staff are working really hard. There's so many details involved, and I just a huge shout out to the staff. They are they're contemplating every if and or what. Um, and PR is is certainly a piece of that puzzle. They're they're working on how they're going to get the information out into the community, not only digitally but also you know on paper. So. Um, I'm happy to answer questions if I if I can. Sure. Could you talk a little bit more about the staff? I mean, are they how are they folding in the work of packing things up with their regular responsibilities? Sharon. Yeah, no, I'm I'm trying to uh everybody's working really, really hard. And um because the timeline has not been set in stone, the amount of programming that they've been doing has, has been whittling down. And so the less programming that they're doing, the more time they have 
uh, to be thinking about how they're going to box up and move and and label and which staff members will be doing what. Um, you know, libra we're, librarians are we're very uh, we're very perpendicular. You know, we, we do step one and then you do step two and you do step three, and so this is kind of made for them. And and I've said to them before, they reworked library services entirely in the matter of a couple of weeks when the pandemic hit. Yeah. Th this is what they're doing. They're doing it again. Um, no fear of getting sick or, 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 you know, so I know they can do it. I know they can do it. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Sharon. Um, Sharon, two questions. One is, um, so during the interim period, will staff be spread out? Even among the even among I mean between the buildings and the other branches, or is there enough space for everyone to still be in the interim locations? Yeah, there's enough space. Um, so we will have added staff at the two branches only during the time where the Jones is closed. Once we reopen at 101, we'll go back to normal hours at all three buildings. Okay. And, and there's room for staff everywhere. And um, yes, all staff will maintain their regular hours. Okay. And the second question is, sorry, Bob, I just, it was a two-part question, not related, but um, so is there any way the community can help? Just with their patients and, and, and they have been awesome. Really, the public has been spectacular. They really care about the staff. Um, and so at this point, that's all, that's all we can ask for is patients. Thank you. Thank you. Bob? Um, Yes, um, it sounds like the, the 101 uh, University Drive is an excellent location. Um, my question is, as always, um, how do the costs for that over 18 months plus the second and the third location uh, relate to the budget that we had in the, the project? Uh, and the second question, and it's similar, is that in the minutes that we just approved, there were a couple of questions that required uh, follow-up answers. And I was wondering whether there are answers on uh, who pays for the insurance and uh, whether there is any uh, change in the project design because with the ceilings being brought down, that allows for insulation to be put in into areas which previously had not had uh, the uh, possibility of, of insulation without having impacts on the original designs. Uh, so as for all the moving costs will be a, a part of the building project. So the library doesn't have to worry about that. Are they um, the same costs? Are they within the $500,000? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the insurance will continue to be paid by the library, uh, just as it always has. Um, and as far as the insulation goes, I, I did ask, and uh, mm -hmm. the answer was no, we still can't do that because of costs. It would cost more. Okay. The insurance question was not about our normal insurance, but rather the cost for the uh, insurance relating to the uh, possible risks to the strong house. That's a part of the building project. No, Bob, the belief was and remains mm -hmm. uh, that it would be covered by the contractor. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions relating to the building project or the uh, interim location? I will say for myself that in terms of an interim location, it's almost unimaginable that we could have found a better one. Uh, it's, it's a great space. It's convenient. There is parking. It's on a bus line. Uh, it's in a well-trafficked area of town. And uh, I just think it's, it's about as good as it could be. Uh, it will require uh, a somewhat higher level of coordination from the library director in terms of the activities 
um, that are going to be at the interim location and the activities that are going to be carried continued to be carried out at the branches. <laughs> and um, again, I think also the idea that we can store some part of our collection uh, with Amherst College is just um, is just really is really terrific. So I, I think all of that is just um, all of that is just great news. Once we have the the bid from the general contractor accepted bid, low bid, uh, things will accelerate in terms of their tempo, uh, in terms of establishing more concrete deadlines for uh, <laughs> packing up and uh, moving out. So stay tuned for stay tuned for that. Okay. Um, next, for anything from buildings and facilities. Um, no, we have not met as yet this year, I think, because everybody's been busy with the move and things like that. The only thing is, um, I guess next week is the months, um, North Amherst opening. So as many of us who can make it will be there and that's going to be exciting. Has the bench been found yet, Sharon? No, it's gone. No. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. No, nothing else, Austin. Yeah, that the grand reopening of North Amherst is is truly a, a really a tremendous moment in mm -hmm. the life of the library system at Amherst, and the the building is beautiful, and it really will be a moment to celebrate uh, the great work that uh, our, the branch li libraries do, um, and to express our gratitude to the anonymous donor whose generosity made all of this. Um, possible so looking forward to that okay next is a report from the development committee Brian, uh, you have a lot of information in your packet but i'll just run through it quickly right. the annual fund uh continuing on the same trend it's been on for this year which is we're slightly ahead of where we were at the same time last year ninety-five thousand versus ninety thousand. A uh, slightly smaller number of gifts, but on average, the gifts are slightly larger. Uh, for the capital campaign, uh, the monthly report was uh, 44,000, which brings us to a little over 86,000 since January 1. There's a lot of activity going on in relationship to publicizing our activities and uh, soliciting support. Uh, again, some of this is in the packet. Uh, you know, the, I'm really looking forward. I'm very excited to see the viewpoint video that's going to be uh, airing widely, commercially, um, between May 6th and May 21st, and on PBS the week of uh, May 20th. And then uh, the Capital Campaign Committee retains access to all the footage that was taken in relationship to this essentially spot. Uh, and the campaign will use it in various ways, which is again, uh, quite wonderful in terms of publicity and soliciting support and um, uh, the economy with which this material was acquired that uh, we paid very, you know, very, very little for having access to so much um, commercial footage that we never could have otherwise gotten. Um, some of us on the Capital Campaign have been leading tours through the library with great frequency, uh, two nights a week and two days each weekend. And we've taken, I would say around a hundred people through and uh, um, this week, I'll be going through the list. Uh, you know, we have information from every, pretty much everybody who went through. Um, so I'll be going through the list of the people who came through on my tours and getting in touch with them to follow up about the capital campaign. I mean, I know that we, sitting on this Zoom screen, are way deep in the weeds of the capital campaign. But there are, it's hard to believe, just as I know nothing about Taylor Swift, it's hard to believe that there are people who don't know anything about the Jones Library Capital Campaign. But it's a fact 
And to them, we're not even in the public phase yet. I mean, they're just amazed that, and, and on my tours, I have not been pitching the capital campaign. I've been very careful to say, I'm taking you on a tour to let the building speak to you about its need to be renovated and expanded. And I, I believe that that message has gotten through, but I will, as I say, follow up with the nearly 100 people who have gone through so far. In addition, we've taken some special people on special tours. These are people who we know have the capacity to give um, significant gifts. Obviously, I'm not gonna tell you who they are. Um, and they have made oral commitments but we don't record those until we actually get them in writing. So I'm looking forward to at least three substantial commitments confirmed in, in the very near future. And in addition, we started to identify, <laughs> many of us in the capital campaign are people of a certain age. We are trying to identify people who are younger than we are. Uh, including people who, you know, live in town, whether or not they grew up in Amherst, but also because there's a network of uh, people who grew up in Amherst, went to the Amherst schools, know the Jones Library, don't now necessarily live in Amherst, but they're connected by a Facebook and other social media, and we're identifying kind of key people and they stay in touch with each other. They have actual physical reunions, but they're in touch by all kinds of social networks. They know about Taylor Swift. So we're identifying people from the classes from the mid eighties to the mid aughts who can, who will be point people, who will help us identify the big people who are, have attachments to Amherst and who also have capacity. Uh, and so that we're in the early stages of doing that. I think that's pretty much what I have to say, although Tammy looks as though she has a thought. Um, there was really substantial coverage on um, WAMC from the local um, Indeed. affiliate. Yeah, did a, a, a lengthy piece on the radio. You were featured. So it was... Uh, and that that goes all over Western Mass. Yeah, no, that was it, that was that was great. We're very grateful to WAMC and to James Palegalopoulos, right. whose name I hope I have not butchered <laughs> too much. Sounds close. Sounds close to me. So uh, I see Bob. Bob, um, two questions. Uh, first one is. Um, there have been discussions of having a essentially a grand opening of the capital campaign, which originally was scheduled for March sometime, but um, it is now getting towards the end of April. And I was wondering if, as and when, that would happen. And the second question has been a question I've asked couple of years, which is that uh, in addition to going to people who have graduated from our high school, um, we actually are the host to a couple of colleges. And there are alumni magazines, which I have always thought might have an interest in these stories about their hometown. Um, and uh, I simply have never heard of any attempt to get that into any alumni magazines and alumni have been known to be generous to their uh, alma maters and sometimes some of them think of Amherst as being part of that. Is that addressed to me? Well, it's a general suggestion, which I've been no, making no, for no, e years. Yeah. Either, I just didn't want to interrupt anybody else who wanted it. Um, I actually have a connection, you know, because of my past life back to UMass Amherst. And uh, I, so I will ask about uh, UMass Magazine. I have, that's all that I can say. I mean, I don't know what their policies are. I don't know what their interests are, but I will certainly ask. And um, I think the capital campaign is waiting until we're, until 
shovel to the ground, and then we'll have a we will have a giant festival celebrating with hard hats uh, the public launch of the capital campaign. Thank you, Lee. We'd okay. hope to do something in the building, but I think the timing is just going to be too tight. Other other questions about the capital campaign? Farah, did you want to ask something? Who is not related to the campaign? Oh. Lee, did you know that Taylor Swift has a new album out? <laughs> I think even I, living under a rock, have heard something about that. About the, is this the one about the poets? Lee is volunteering to lead the Taylor Swift subcommittee, and we'll get monthly reports about the later develop, latest developments in Swifty land. We should be so lucky. Lee, um, one thing that might be just useful for all of us is to be reminded of or what I'm going to say, some process questions. So could you talk a little bit just in a general way about the process of reaching, cultivating, closing with donors. I mean, it is a tremendous amount of work. It, it, yeah, it, it would be nice if you could just write a letter or pick up the yeah. phone or knock on a door and say, I'm here for the Jones Library Capital Campaign and I would like you to give me a sign a check for a million dollars. Yep. Yeah, it does not work that way. Yep. Uh, sometimes, you know, there you have donors who have a pre-existing relationship with your entity, but often, it, it, I mean, it, 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 fundraising is all about, uh, on the individual level, it's all about relationships, personal relationships, institutional relationships, and it takes a while to cultivate. Yeah. Uh, we've been cultivating in, in a quiet way since it appeared that this campaign or this project um, was starting. And we've been ramping up the cultivation and the sophistication with which we can identify people who might be interested in the library, people who have capacity to give, um, people who have a track record of philanthropic activity. And we contact them in a variety of ways. We have house parties, we um, have take tours, we eat many, 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 many lunches and have many, many, many cups of coffee. Uh, and, and that's how we've gotten where we've gotten. We have raised over $9 million. Uh, in, again, I'm not gonna be whining and I'm not gonna be self-pitying, but in circumstances that have been quite a challenge because uh, ideally you build up momentum and you have, you know, you pick up momentum and you have the wind at your back and things. This campaign has been filled with stopping and starting uh, and um, just hard to, hard to, build and sustain momentum, which is, you know, once we have shovels in the ground, everybody knows that the project is definitely going forward. And there are people we have spoken to who say, don't talk to me until you can absolutely guarantee me that this is happening. So that's, that's it. Did, right. did that answer your question? Yeah, I think it's useful yeah. for all of us yeah. and, and the, the public beyond us to be reminded that uh, there's a tremendous amount of work that is absolutely invisible to us and is not reflected in a monthly number that goes on from day to day and week to week to put us in position where uh, substantial gifts can be made. And I, I just think it's useful, certainly useful for me to be reminded of all of that um, more or less in labor that's invisible to us uh, that is necessary in order for the campaign mm. uh, to succeed. The other thing, of course, that uh, you all have done, which is reflected in the 
monthly report, but again, I assume there's much more going on, is to identify uh, foundation support, corporate support, governmental grants. And again, tremendous amount of work goes into trying to figure out what those are and then to uh, work to figure out how best to approach a foundation or how best to position oneself to get a grant. So I'm, uh, I think it's, again, I'm grateful for the- well, Yeah, thank you for reminding me. I meant to say something about, about the grants. We have several in process. Again, I don't want to talk about them until until yep. we get them. And and right, I don't I don't like to dwell on the difficulties, which is why I don't. You haven't heard much about them. I just like to put my head down yep. and get the job done. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Lee. Bob. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> At the last budget committee meeting, um, I had said that I thought I should meet with the capital campaign leadership and those who are running the, the uh, actual dollars of it. Um, and, it and I <clears throat> thought that, that that would be an appropriate way for me to at least get a better handle on things. Um, at that budget committee meeting, it was suggested that uh, I could not do that within my current uh, 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 role uh, uh, without first getting an approval from the board. My reading of the MOU with the uh, uh, Friends of the Jones basically said that that I should be able to to get whatever I needed in terms of uh, looking at things. Um, but I thought that it was appropriate since the question was raised at the budget committee that we actually have a discussion about whether um, I or anyone else who would be in the budget committee um, can and should uh, take a look inside of the way in which the campaign is being uh, managed and how many dollars are there and so on. So I am bringing that up here and now so that we can at least have that discussion and either um, I can know that it is within or not within my scope of, of duties. Bob, can you explain a little bit? I'm, I'm not clear what it is that you're... Mm -hmm. What is it you're suggesting? I mean, I had suggested the campaign. Some... Let me. I'm sorry. How the campaign is being managed? Mm -hmm. uh, just if you could explain a little bit what you have, what you have in mind. I had suggested that I meet with uh, Kent and Ginny and, and Nat uh, and just see exactly what is happening and you know how it is uh, put it into bank accounts and and how that all functions at a, a more concrete level. Uh, it seemed to me that that was simply an appropriate thing to do. And uh, the budget committee discussion basically said, you should really go to the board before you go and do such a thing. So yep. here I am. Or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, aren't... Why would we want to micromanage another committee? Like, don't don't we <laughs> no? Uh, don't we trust that they know what they're doing and that this is what they're doing and this is within their scope of work? And um, I I, I just I I don't understand what you're saying. You want me to answer? No, yeah, I just, I don't understand the reasoning behind that. Actually. Why do we bother having a director? Because each of the people in the library knows what they should be doing. It's because sometimes one does actually look. So I I think it's, I think, a, for, let me just, I'm sorry. I, yeah, think it's a, sorry. I think it's a really good question that you've raised. Uh, the board now gets a monthly accounting from the 
capital campaign of progress, uh, which gives me confidence about what's going on. If there are other questions that need to be answered, uh, I think they can be asked and answered. So uh, if there's a, like, where is the money being kept? I think it could be asked and answered. Uh, how much and when is being turned over to the town? I think it can be asked and answered. So I'm not sure why any one of us, given that we 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 get a monthly report, uh, if there are questions, they can be asked and answered. So I, I don't understand why there would be a need for a, a kind of separate meeting. We have the co-chair of the capital campaign and of our development committee who can, I think, answer questions. And if the questions can't be answered because she doesn't have the information, uh, she can get she can get the information. So for my for myself, I I'm not still not exactly sure what particular things. Uh, I'm not not saying we shouldn't get it, but I'm not exactly sure what it is that you would be asking and why it can't be asked in a trustees meeting so that we're all we're all informed about it. Is that a question to me? Uh, it's 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 an observation. If you have a comment on it, I'm happy to entertain the comment. Sure. The actual pace of receipts has been substantially lower than what I had been led to believe would occur. So I am very interested in knowing whether the actual receipt rate is going to likely change based upon what they are actually doing you know, behind the wall, if you will. Um, in addition, there are a series of individual uh, policy decisions that are made uh, which deal with the dollar amount which is ready to be released, which um, I need to understand better because I am uh, not certain that they reflect the best interests of the library or the town. Um, and I would like to get a better understanding of each of those. If you would like me to do each of those things at a budget committee meeting um, and ask all of those questions in the context of a budget committee meeting, I would be willing to do that. I thought it would be wiser to do that first in the setting of uh, administering the MOU, um, which is exactly what I thought it required me to do. So I have a suggestion, maybe it would be good to do this. At our next trustees meeting, let's review the MOU. Since uh, I think at least one of us wasn't on the trustee, maybe more than one of us at the time that that MOU was created. Let's, let's review the MOU between the library and the capital campaign. And then it seems to me we can come back to this question of what kind of information is needed in order to effectuate uh, the memorandum of understanding. Okay. As I understand it, what the what the we have committed to, what the capital campaign is committed to, is to turn over dollars as they come in. Uh, that may be wrong, but that's my understanding. So uh, I'm still not exactly sure what other questions we need to be asking, but I think you're right. We should look at the memorandum of understanding, uh, probably do it on a periodic basis, certainly do it, you know, we can do it on an next trustees meeting and be clear about what the relationship is and should be between the trustees and the, and the capital campaign. 
How about that? How about we do that? It's fine. Um, I'm not sure by that point I will still be on the board, but that's fine. Well, it's uh, again, Bob, you're raising an issue that is not just about you, right? I understand we're, that. We're grateful to you for the work that you do, but this is a, I take it the question you're raising is a question about our responsibility, the mm -hmm. Board of Trustees' responsibility in relationship to that memorandum of understanding. So I think we should just take a look at it everybody bring themselves up to speed if there are things that we need to be doing that we're not doing mm -hmm. uh, that would be the moment to say gee we should be doing this and that okay other questions about the capital campaign or development well thank you lee and thanks thank your colleagues for us for the enormous amount of work that they are um, that they are that they are doing well, we're happy to be doing it. Good. Well, we're, we're grateful. Okay. So, Tammy, PPP. Okay. Um, PPP has not met since the last um, board meeting. However, I have conferred with Sharon about the evaluation process, which, of course, will be complicated by the packing and the moving. Um, so at our May meeting, we will be reviewing the evaluation um, uh, forms and bringing them to the June board meeting. And I can distribute them obviously to people online, the board and people in town, but my concern is the staff yep. and they're gonna be very busy. So I'm, I'm talking with Sharon about logistics. We're going to wait until the staff have unpacked and opened and then do the staff portion and the public portion of the evaluation process. So I just wanted to update you on that. Um, I'm going to turn it to uh, Farah. Do you have a report on, on the JEDI meeting? <laughs> yeah, um, thanks, uh, Tammy. Well, we basically discussed the collection development benchmarks that uh, the presentation that Betsy had, the, had um, she said a few meetings ago, and we were talking about, there were some questions about how we can get this out to the public to let the public know where we are with our collection. And there was some conversation about maybe Betsy writing up something uh, or putting her presentation on the library website or in a newsletter. Am I right, uh, Sharon? Isn't that what we discussed? I mean, you weren't there, but we, you, Mia, you and I chatted about it. So I think the thing is where where uh, Ginny, who's also on the Jedi committee, was going to work with Betsy and see if we can get something out either on the website or in the newsletter. The other thing uh, Mia had brought up, she was kind of picking our brains about programming in the interim period, and we threw out some ideas about can we check in with Town Hall and use the the room they have down there for some of the children's programming, or um, I think there was some talk about the Mead Museum. But I think since then, Sharon, as you said today, that we sort of have a few spaces where the programming will continue. So it was just a lot of discussion about these two things. Nothing, and we're meeting again on Friday. So if anyone wants to attend, it's at 1230. Thank you, Farah. Yep. So that's our report. Okay, Bob? Um, at the last meeting, I had asked uh, whether there was any plans for PPP to look at the question of whether we have any policies with respect to whistleblowers, retention and destruction of records, and conflict of interest. Um, I, I is that with, on the agenda? I met with Sharon and about that and she's going to check with the town first to see what kind of policies the town has in place for those um features so so i haven't i had discussed it with her when we met about the evaluation and she said she would first check with the town so it is on our radar thank you thank you okay other questions about the ppp or the jedi committee Tara, could you just uh, remind 
us uh, the membership of the Jedi Committee? Um, there's uh, Mia from the children's uh, room. Um, Melissa Juro, who's the co-founder of Embrace Race. Um, Ginny Hamilton with her non-capital campaign hat. Um, Walter, I'm blanking on his last name. Lloyd. Sorry. Lloyd, yes. He's, uh, he used, he just graduated from the high school. He's at UMass. Um, uh, yours truly and, and that's it, right? Ra Raphael Rogers. Oh, Raphael. Yes. Rogers, who is at, um, Clark University. And an amazing resource for us. Um, he and Melissa Giro, actually, with all the work they do, the DEI work they do, and their experience with work related to racial issues, they've been amazing. But um, we're still like, one of the things I forgot to mention is we're still waiting for the surveys to come back. Mm -hmm. Um, they're sort of trickling in. I think it's sort of slowed down. So I think we're going to, there's going to be a push to send them out again once, uh, in the interim location. And then I guess we start discussing a little more over the next few months or in the fall. Great. Yeah. Great. Well, again, set, get, get, express the gratitude of the board. Um, okay. again, we, we're, we're really grateful for the work that you all are doing. Thank you. Okay, next is the budget committee. Mm -hmm. Bob. Well, the budget committee was canceled this past week, so um, it did not meet. There are minutes for the last four or five budget committee meetings included in the packet. Um, <clears throat> the the one item which is on the agenda here is a proposal for an organizational credit card for the Jones Library. I have had some discussions about this with John Shannon, who is our business manager, um, but I had not seen the proposal until it was put onto this packet. It basically reflects my discussions with him although the budget committee has not looked at it yet. Um, it calls for basically uh, two credit cards to be uh, uh, credited to the library. One for small items which are currently uh, used by staff for small items, like um, if we are buying $5 gift certificates um, uh, for a kids program right now the way that works is that a staff member essentially puts out the money um, and then gets reimbursed and that's really not a very good way to do things and then there's a second card which would require approval by the appropriate level of, of authority the budget uh, committee chair or uh, or the treasurer or the vice treasurer or the um, for contract work, which is of a high value, but where the vendor is basically recommending strongly that uh, it, excuse me, second. Um, where the vendor is recommending that that it be done through a credit card rather than a check. And I'm not sure why and how we would need to do that for a vendor, but it's conceivable that there are cases of that kind. Um, so, you know, there are no rules at this point written for this, and obviously we would not want to approve it without rules. But I'm just bringing this to you so that at least you have an understanding of, of this item, which is being discussed within the budget committee. Right, John. Did you want to say anything about this uh, idea yeah. of an organizational yeah. credit card? Sure. I'll try to get, kind of give you a brief summary of just the. Bob mentioned some of the reasons we would like to do it, and I'll give you. Um, I'll try to give you that and just a little background about it. So right. we we kind of, there are a few categories of expenses that we 
um, right now we we rely on on our um, on our staff, like Bob said. Sometimes those are small purchases. Sometimes they're not small purchases. And and we, what we run into is that increasingly vendors don't don't take paper checks. They have no way to process them anymore because their 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 business is essentially online. Um, and so we want to be able to pay them and not ask our staff to advance thousand dollar purchases and that way to get reimbursed by us. Um, so that's that's one category. The other another possible category is that um, when we have to pay, let's say uh, uh, one of our blanking on the name, but our our streaming video provider that we have, uh, you know, our, those 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 payments tend to run like four to eight thousand dollars, and we're putting paper checks in the mail for that amount of money. And during COVID, we had a it happened a few times that we. We checks were lost. Um, they weren't cashed by, you know, I think nothing bad happened in the sense that no one else got a hold of them, but they never arrived. And so we want to avoid interruption of service and we want to reduce the risk of payment paying that way. And also recognizing that more and more uh, vendors don't really want to get, they don't want to get checks in the mail. Some some vendors are fine, some are not. So the, the issue we've had getting a credit card, and it's true for most nonprofits, is that uh, most credit card companies want, they don't want to face a library. They want to face a board member often, um, in, you know, in the case of a, of a nonprofit. And that we don't want to ask uh, board members to do that because, again, we're asking an individual to assume that risk um, for, the, for the library in this case. And so we, um, there's an organization that specializes in credit cards for nonprofits. We, would be the, we, the library, would be the customer. They would approve us. Um, we would have the ability to have one or more cards, as Bob said. The the, the credit card issuer, it's it's basically it's Commerce Bank um, and Mastercard are partnering with this with this organization. Um, we can, they'll give us a you know they'll, obviously they'll they'll give us a credit limit when we apply. We can then have uh, per card limits. So if we have a card that we want staff to use, where we know they shouldn't have to spend over a certain amount. We can make that. We can set that limit ourselves, um, and we can set a different one for. I would say, kind of the vice treasurer, de deputy treasurer, treasurer role as well. Um, and uh, the reconciliation process would look probably very much like it does for invoices. We'd have the same controls over it. Um, we would pay it out of our out of our corporate checking account at the end of every month, just like we would with any other kind of card. Um, but the advantage would be that we would be able to, um, you know, that, that, that this, this company charity charge would be facing the library and not an individual. So that's, that's kind of the, that's kind of a, a kind of a, a brief overview of what it would look like. Uh, Sharon, do you know, uh, the practices at, um, uh, other libraries. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, in all the other libraries that I worked at, staff have had to um, uh, use their own credit card and then get reimbursed. And but you know, times have changed. I'm old, and now here is this opportunity to get uh, an organizational credit card uh, that doesn't cost money and that doesn't require any of our social security numbers. That's why I have always said no. I'm not giving up my social security number for for this kind of a thing. Um, so the fact that this exists now is so great and would satisfy so many problems. And as John said, it it will still go through all the same proper channels. Um, so no one person could ever uh, use the card and you know head on off to Aruba or anything like that. Yeah. And the other thing I was gonna just mention very quickly is that QuickBooks, which is our, you know, which is our, our accounting bookkeeping software, uh, is falls into this category. And the, the additional problem is that once you pay for it, whoever pays for it has to leave their own credit card on file with QuickBooks um, for for automated renewal. So you can't just pay for it and say, oh, I'll give you another card next year. And so, I mean, I get that's, you know, these are the kinds of things that I I, I would like to um, not have to, uh, I would like us not have to, to, to not have to deal with, so. And charity charge does not charge well, correct the they yet yeah, their deal is with is with deal you know they make their money through um an, an arrangement with commerce bank and uh mastercard so and so we don't there's no um 
we don't have an annual fee. The cost is not directed at us. It's directed at the, um, you know, the vendor for accepting the card and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, that's where it comes from. And they have, I don't know the total number of, I can find out, I have some background information. I don't know the number of uh, customers they have, but their customers, as far as kind of annual budget range anywhere from a hundred thousand to a hundred million. So they have a, they cover a pretty broad range and they're the only, they are the only uh, company I can find that does this. Now, the major card issuers will tell you that they offer cards to nonprofits. What they really do is offer a business card that basically puts you back where you started, which is they want to face somebody and not the library. And does charity charge charge interest or late fees for they may they may i think that they i'd have to look into that but i know that they they want to see the and this uh all right so they issue the monthly statement 20 days before it's due so we have enough time to do the approval for that for that monthly statement but to answer i would have to look into that to answer your question right. but they do have the expectation that it will be paid on a monthly basis yeah it'd be good as we talk about this to if if for some reason we were late, is there a late fee? Is there an interest charge? Yes. Uh, to to find out exactly. Yeah. I I will find that out. What the arrangement is, Sharon. Yeah. Uh, for in other town departments or like the schools, do they have organizational credit cards? I, I so understand again, that the town does, um, but so I don't as, know how it works. Yeah. So as we continue to talk about this it would be good to just find out at the town sure. level schools. I mean, what, what, what the practice, what the practices are, because as Bob said, we're going to want to be clear about what the policies are. It would be good to have some, something. Yeah. To and, and the other piece of this is that we want to do it in such a way that, that, um, well, that we're comfortable obviously with how we're using it, but also that the auditors feel that whatever controls yeah. we have are, you know, reflect what they would expect to see for, for using a card. Like right. this. Yeah. So other questions about this organizational credit card, are there things that you want to ask John or Sharon to look into or any information that you want as we begin to think about doing this? Okay. Well, we will look forward to more conversations about um, this. Thank you for raising it. Uh, and we'll look forward to getting more information about it. Great. Thank you. Bob, anything else about the budget from the budget committee? I believe we have submitted the budget for next year to the town. It has been amended to add $25,000 to the, the two areas which I had recommended. Um, <clears throat> it is based upon, I guess, Sharon's best understanding of what the costs are likely to be in our new facility. Yep. Okay. I thank you. Any other questions about the budget? Okay. Next, investment, Bob. Okay. The <clears throat> we met comparatively recently, uh, but that covered only the period through um, December and, and January. We have not yet met on the March quarter. Um, <clears throat> I have not set that up yet because I thought it might be appropriate if there were uh, other people who might be interested in uh, being participants in this. Uh, as of March 31st, uh, the endowment was valued at $9,176,576. And the Woodbury Fund was valued at $750,507.65. Um, <clears throat> those are obviously higher numbers than we have seen in a while. Um, they're not quite at the highest it's ever been. And the last week has not been kind, basically, to investors. So um, I don't know exactly where we will be by the time we get to the next quarter. Um, but uh, <clears throat> these were at least encouraging numbers. 
Um, we are now dealing with Dan Voss as the representative of, of our exterior advisors, um, but he is now representing Mercer rather than Vanguard. The reporting still comes out of Vanguard. When I look for the reports, I go to the Vanguard site. <coughs> um, so I don't know exactly how Mercer's uh, oversight uh, is going to work for all of this. And um, I hope at our next meeting, uh, we will get a clearer understanding of all of that. Um, I assume that they will not be micromanaging him. Right. Any questions about investment? Okay. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Rich Morris from the Friends of the Jones Library. Good morning. Good morning. There is a consensus that has developed on the board that the board wants more of face to face contact with individual trustees. Now we have more than enough contact with Lee, so that's fine. Um, but I have to produce on the other members of the board. So, um, I'm noticing, and I don't want to make this too regimented, but uh, I'm looking, we have seven to eight uh, meetings left this year, and it would be great if the, the other five members of the board individually volunteered for one additional meeting this year to just hang out with the board. Um, we, have, uh, we have a meeting on May 13th, which is just the board. Uh, and then we have a, our annual public meeting, which is June 10th. So um, I'm looking for volunteers or at least to think for the, um, the other five members of the board to think about when they would like to attend and um, um, just be present at, uh, at, a, at a friend's meeting. And you get to meet the whole crew and just see who is, you know, on the on the friends executive board and i see ferris hand up uh when is the what time is the may 13th meeting it's um five o'clock 5 p.m uh -huh. and it, go, it runs about an hour and a half <clears throat> and rich could you say timmy just one sec could you sure. rich, could you say exactly what it is that you want so a board, you want a board member, which is sounds like a great idea to come to a meeting. Uh, I think I think just just a general sentiment on the board that um, that the friends have gotten sort of out, sort of out separated from the trustees. Um, I'm not I'm not looking for a lot of contact. I'm just looking for some. So um, and just just so the trustees know who the friends are and and. Um, and what we're doing and how we um, how we discuss and that that kind of thing. So you're basically looking for a board member to come and kind of sit in the audience and watch. Yeah, the yeah. I can do the thirteenth. Uh, okay. Just, just, oh, just, just. I'm sorry. So in the past, pre-COVID, we had a tradition of meeting once a year the the board of the library and the board of the friends and are you suggesting this as um <laughs> an alternative to that or you like this better than doing that uh, have you have you thought I mean, about that i think there was um some concern about having too many board members at a friends meeting um regarding open meeting law that sort of sort of thing and by the way i did not really know about this tradition um and if we if you want to reinstate that tradition that that might suffice but um but that that hasn't come up what has been suggested is having um lee have a a, a guest with her um from the board sharon yeah so uh i did um I, I did mention the the joint meetings and it's not that they were against that, but they were way more interested in really you guys going to their meetings. They they want to know more about you personally. They want to get to know you more that way. So they thought having these, you know, like intimate one on one as opposed to these, you know, really public and structured meetings. OK, uh, Tammy. 
Yeah, I had planned to come to the uh, annual meeting at Munson. So well, that would be I'll great. I'll come to that. I used oh. to be the representative before Lee, but now all the some of the board members have changed. I do know some of them, but I don't know all of them. So I'll come to the annual meeting. Which well, that check. So that checks two members off my list right now, and then I can chase Austin, you know, through the fall or whatever. You know? I think maybe, Rich, the thing to do is to send the calendar of uh, meetings to Sh Sharon. Sure. And Sharon can, um, you know, Gene isn't here right now. We'll have a new member, uh, you know, when Bob uh, when Bob leaves. So if you'd send it to Sharon, Sharon can send it to to all of us and people can opt in and say, I can do this in November, I can do this in September. All right. Well, thank you, Farah and Tammy, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, other than that, um, I don't know, Lee, Lee was at the meeting, at the last meeting, is there anything more that I need to report? I, I don't, I think I got it all. I think I've got what's most important. Yeah, um, Sharon was there and the friends gave some money for programming. Yeah. And, and otherwise it was just a, an ordinary meeting with the usual reports to the friends. If I missed anything, Sharon will pick it up. Rich, anything else? Nothing else. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, <laughs> thanks to the friends, and we will look forward to. Um, I, I, I what I, I what I do is I report back about these meetings with my particular perspective to the friends we we forgive you i mean we're grateful um all right sharon yeah so the first thing that uh one of the things that the friends approved was uh forty one hundred dollars to be withdrawn from woodbury uh for museum passes for fy25 and so uh, i'm asking that you all approve that as well so you want us uh, to to vote to approve this? Correct. Okay. Is there a motion from a board member? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. Voting to approve. Uh, Farah? Yes. Bob? Yes. Lee? Yes. Tammy? Yes. And Austin votes yes. And the only other thing that I wanted to talk about was the library on Saturday. We hosted uh, Tony Dieter, Lizzie, Holly Black, and uh, the first uh, session of Spiderwick Chronicles, the new series that's out on Roku. Um, it was awesome. It was so. It was our last big event that is mm -hmm. that will ever happen in the, the the Woodbury room as it stands now. The place was packed. There was over a hundred people. Wow. Uh, some folks came from, there was Rhode Island, there was Washington DC represented, um, a ton of college students, uh, people and, and little students, um, just people who love fantasy. Uh, it was so great. So huge shout out to the children's department. They put a lot of work into this. There were some IT issues, but it all got solved. Um, they brought, they're famous now, you know, to, and and, um, and it was just a really great event. And so I just wanted to tell you that. Yay. Right. That's it. So uh, I have a question, Sharon, on a somewhat different subject you may you may be able to answer this if you can't answer it now you might like at a future meeting several states in the united states are considering legislation to protect libraries and to protect librarians connecticut new jersey california are among those states i don't know what the status of whether there's any such legislation already existing in the state of Massachusetts or whether there is, if, if there isn't, whether there's any sense that there should be. Uh, and I wonder if you, do you know of whether there is any such legislation in the state of Massachusetts? 
I know they've been working on, not necessarily to protect librarians, Massachusetts is thankfully way different from Florida and Texas. Um, you know, we're not losing our jobs because we're putting gender queer on our shelves. Uh, but unfortunately, my colleagues in other states, that's exactly what's happening. Um, there are initiatives right now in Boston regarding access, um, access to online um, audio, for example. Right now, libraries have to pay a lot of money in order to have access to these items, and it doesn't necessarily, the access doesn't last forever. There's a cutoff date, and um, so, so there's that piece. I will have to look further into the the question about actually protecting librarians. Yeah, you um, again, if if you could, um, you might consult with the you know the state library association um, and see what they are, um, what they what they think. Uh, alas, unfortunately, Massachusetts is not immune to some of the problems that have emerged in Connecticut and New Jersey. So this is not just the, you know, Florida and Texas thing, but I, I don't know about Massachusetts. I don't know what's there. I don't know what the Massachusetts Library Association is doing, whether they think the adequate protection, but it would be good if at a future meeting, you could let us know what you find out. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, anything else for the director? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bob. Um, <clears throat> I have for a couple of years been collecting uh, printouts of the uh, newsletter published by a Connecticut library where we used to live. Um, it is in many ways a, a much easier and uh, more attractive presentation of things that are done. Um, since we have not met in person in a couple of years, I've not had any real way to uh, talk about it or show any of those things. Um, so what I think I will do is I will bring it to the library and if Sharon would make sure that it was available whenever board members are in the library, they can take a look at, at this folder of materials um, and if the people who do the actual preparation of our newsletters online uh, could take a look at it, it might be helpful for all of you. Right. That sounds that sounds great. And Bob, again, I I say this with a sense of I ask this question with a sense of sadness. Uh, do you yet know when you may be resigning from the board? I ask because it would be. Uh, you know, we want to have as little of a, an interruption in terms of the full membership of the board. Do, do you yet know uh, what your plan is? I, at this moment, think that I will be doing it next month. Um, I think I've probably got uh, one more meeting of the investment committee in right. me and maybe one more meeting of the budget committee. Um, right and possibly a meeting with the uh, uh, capital campaign staff. Um, but we will see about that. But right. basically, my, my thought is I will probably be resigning in May. Okay. Um, my plans to leave have not changed drastically, although I have not yet sold my house. And so if there are people who are listening in who want to uh, <laughs> take a look at the house. You know, I have a broker. <laughs> okay, I don't think this should be a commercial, Bob, but good. <laughs> All right. Um, well. But, uh, you know, th those are the considerations that uh, are in my mind. Okay, well, we, we're, 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 we're grateful for you keeping us informed. And again, only you stay for as long as you possibly can. Uh, but we want to think about not having a vacancy for as long as we can avoid it. Okay. Anything else for the director? All right, everybody. I think we'll say 
uh, Zeitkozunt, uh, happy Passover for those of you that celebrate. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Stay well, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thank you.